Good morning. This is Mark Richardson. I'm uh, coming to you for this monthly webinar from Scotts Valley, California. Uh, welcome to all of you. And uh, I also have Brian Schwarz with me. He's uh, monitoring this uh, this webinar. So at the end of our one hour together, we're going to uh, entertain any questions you may have. Uh, so I believe you have to email those to Brian, and then he'll read them to me, and we will we will answer them. So we're got we got a pretty full day this morning. We're going to look at two different projects. You can see I've got Emmyscope open in front of me, and the first project we're going to to look at is associated with one of our application notes, application note number eight on power measurements. So. And then the second one is a tutorial from our manual called the OMA tutorial or the uh, Operating Modal Analysis tutorial. Now the topic of discussion today is signal processing and that in our vernacular at, at Vibrant is a rather broad uh, topic that covers a lot of different things. So we're going to start out with looking at the power in a, in a measurement, in a time signal, and then in its spectrum. Uh, and then we're going to use for the OMA tutorial, we're going to do a round trip and start with some mode shapes and we're going to use our MIMO commands, the multiple input output uh, commands to excite a structure using its mode shapes as the dynamic model of the structure. Then we're going to form some cross spectra uh, by just looking at the responses. And this would be an OMA where we don't measure forces, we just measure responses. And we're going to curve fit those cross spectra and compare the results with the original mode shapes. So that's the, the second VTPRJ we're going to use today. Uh, you can see I'm open to my start page. Uh, those two projects are listed under recent projects and then a couple of other projects that I've been working on lately. Uh, this is brand new software. Uh, I might mention also at the end of the, the uh, webinar that we will, we're recording this, so we will put a video out on our website with a link to it. Uh, actually, it's in YouTube. And we'll also put a link to these two projects so that you can get them and go through the exercise over again uh, more slowly than I'm going to go today so that you'll get a better understanding of what we're doing. Uh, I believe the app note has been sent to you and I'm going to open this project here and uh, one of the problems is we can't send you a VTPRJ uh, through the, uh, from the webinar because they only allow text files like a doc file or a, a PDF so we can't send the VTPRJ to you you'll have to get it uh, through the link that we will we will uh, provide with the video. Here we have two data block windows. Each of them has a sine wave in it. And one of the sine waves is completing an integral number of cycles. So if you look over here on the left, this one that's called 3515 is a sine wave that's making one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, and then an extra half cycle here. Now let's look at the one on the right. This is one is 35 or 3125. Those are actually the frequencies of these sine waves, and we'll we'll look at them here in a minute when we go through this through this app note. But this sine wave is making one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles. It's making exactly four cycles in the window, and we call that our sampling window. So when we acquire data from the real world, uh, we the data acquisition system, the analyzer, the uh, whatever the terminology you use for the hardware that acquires your data, that does the uh, uh, acquisition, the analog to 
digital conversion and filtering and so forth, this amount of data is what we call the sampling window. So in one case, the one on the left is not an integer number of cycles. The one on the right is four cycles of the sine wave. Now that's very important for the FFT. So all the frequency processing that we do in MEScope, and for that matter in any FFT analyzer, is uh, subject to this restriction that we must have the signal completely contained within the window. Or another way of saying that is that we have to have an integer number of cycles. If it's a sine wave like this, uh, an integer number of cycles of the sine wave in the sampling window. I'm going to go over here and here's my project list. You can see there's no structures. There's just the two data blocks. There's no shape tables. There's no acquisitions, reports, my, macros. And down here is an added file. Now that's where you can add documents. And in this case, it's a uh, PDF of the application note. Uh, I've got the cursor sitting on that document. You can see that on my disk, it's located under uh, ME scope, VES, application notes, app note number eight, and a PDF. So I'm going to double click on that. So here is the PDF. Let me remove some of the stuff on the borders. Uh, here's a copy of it, and it starts off by saying that your package, your MEScope package must include the VES 3000 signal processing option. Now that has a number of features in it, but the one that we're going to use here in a minute is the FFT. So the signal processing option uh, adds the FFT capabilities to our basic visual ODS package. Uh, down here is a little bit of a description. The, the FFT actually computes something we call the digital Fourier transform, or the DFT. And that's just a, a digitized or sampled uh, spectrum of the time waveform. So one of the real advantages of the FFT is that I can look at my data either as sampled time domain data, the way it was acquired from the uh, sensors on the on the machine or the structure, typically accelerometers, or I can look at its spectrum. And then when we see peaks in the spectrum, we can pick out frequencies and we can curve fit them for modes and get the modal frequencies and damping and mode shapes and so forth. So we're going to do that in the second in the second example. But in this example, we're just going to talk about the power in a signal. So how do we measure power? Well, here's a, here's a definition of it. Uh, it's a, an integral. This is calculus uh, normalized by the length of time. So that would be the, the time down here. If I look below in, in, in the data, uh, this is the time axis. So here we got 12 seconds of data in both cases, a little more than 12 seconds. Uh, let me go back to the... Uh, I'm going to see if I can put this down. Okay, let's just look at this document here for a second. So that's the way power is defined uh, using calculus, but in a, in a digital world, we define it as a summation of things. So that's the approximation to the integral. And for what we call a linear spectrum or an RMS spectrum, this is the common terminology we use, the power is simply the squared values of the real and imaginary part, or the magnitude squared. So if it's an auto spectrum, we just square the magnitude. That gives us a, a measure of the power. Uh, let's go back here to the second column. If it's a mean squared or a power spectrum, many times we refer to auto power spectrum, cross power spectrum. We use that terminology. Uh, when we say power, we mean the units are squared. In other words, it's in G squared or inches per second squared uh, if it's acceleration or inches per second squared. There, we simply sum up the magnitudes, and that's a measure of the power in a power spectrum. So here's a little more description of 
what we call a one-sided or a two-sided FFT. Now, power is only measured here in this integral over time zero to t, but in fact the FFT and the Fourier transform itself are defined from minus infinity to plus infinity over the time axis as an integral and same same in the frequency domain. So if we're going to measure power in a time signal, we need to decide or make a distinction between whether we're talking about a one-sided FFT or a two-sided. One-sided means that all the power is in the zero to t integral or the summation from zero to uh, the total time of the time window. Two-sided means that half of that power was distributed to the negative frequencies in the spectrum. So when we measure a time signal, it's got all the power in it. When we apply the FFT and compute a DFT, then in emiscope, we can tell emiscope either assign half of the power to the negative and the positive frequencies or put all the power in the positive frequencies. Now in emiscope and in most analyzers, we only display the positive frequencies. In other words, we only display half of the, the DFT or the digital Fourier spectrum. The other half doesn't have any new information in it. Uh, it's what we call Hermitian, to use a, a word, a mathematical word, uh, the magnitudes are the same, the phases are different in the negative frequencies, but they're exactly the same data as the positive frequencies. If we do the Hermitian conversion of the, of the phase. Okay, so power calculations in emiscope correct for one-sided versus two-sided. So you don't have to worry about that. You just have to know whether you're set up for one-sided or two-sided FFTs when you, when you apply the FFT to your data. Okay, so let's go down here. Example one is a periodic sine wave. That's what I already discussed with you, the data block with the 3125 or label 3125. This window contains a 0.3125 hertz sine wave with a peak magnitude of 1. So here's a picture of it, and we're going to go look at that in a second and look at the power uh, in that sine wave. So let's go on down here, uh, and okay, we're going, this is a discussion about something called leakage. So let me go back to the, the two sine waves. Because this sine wave is not periodic in its sampling window, when I look at its spectrum, when I compute its spectrum, and we'll do that in a minute, uh, the spectrum will have leakage in it because the FFT algorithm assumes that all of the signal is contained within the window. And it's not quite all contained because we got another half cycle out here. This signal over here is completely contained in other words, if I extended my sampling window out to double or triple or however many multiples of the sampling window time axis, the signal will not change. It's the same signal as we go out in time. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at the, first we're just going to use one of our commands in Emiscope called statistics. So I did a right click on the window itself and that's called a context menu or a right click menu and here's a command down here called statistics. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and now let's do another command, my favorite command, center the data block window. Again I right click on the window and now I can see the sine wave covering 90% of my emiscope window here. And uh, now we have a list of all the statistics in this particular sine wave. So we have the minimum, the maximum, the mean value, the mean squared, the RMS, 
and right down here is the power and the linear power. And then we got crest factor skew and kurtosis. These are other statistics on this particular signal. Now if I do apply the FFT to this signal, let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to go down under the transform menu and say give me the Fourier transform or the FFT. In this case I'm going to apply the FFT and that will give me the digital Fourier transform of this signal. Okay, there it is. And you can see the statistics have changed quite a bit. However, the power and the linear power are exactly the same. Here's the signal over here, at least the non-zero part of it. I'm going to zoom in over here and we'll just take a look at this. And I'm going to turn on my line cursor and the cursor value and let's just pull that cursor over there. And we can see that in fact in the frequency domain the spectrum of this sine wave is a single sample with a magnitude of 1G. Uh, that was the magnitude of the sine wave in the time domain. And it's exactly at the frequency of the sine wave, 0.3125 hertz. And then all the other values of the spectrum are zero because there's no other content in this sine wave. It, it only has a, uh, a single value at the frequency of the sine wave and the amplitude and the power over here has not changed. It's exactly the same. So if I, I go back here and go back to the time domain, now I'll use the inverse FFT. The nice thing about the FFT is that I can go backwards and forwards on this signal as many times as I like and I never lose any accuracy, the, the, the waveforms don't change, I can go back and forth and look at these uh, signals in the time or in the frequency. So this really helps you gain an understanding of, of uh, vibration and how things look in the time domain versus how they look in the frequency domain. I'm going to put that one back over and now let's go take a look at um, this signal and let's go ahead and put up its statistics and there they are. Now this is the one that's not periodic. You can see that the minimum and the maximum are the same, the mean is the same, the mean squared, the RMS, these are all the same values and the power is the same. 0.5 and 0.707, the linear power and the power. So now let's go over and look at the signal in the frequency domain. Quite a different spectrum. You can see now that this is, this is showing the leakage in the signal. Let me zoom in here a little bit. And I'll turn on the cursor and the cursor value. Now with this signal we, we get a completely different amplitude because uh, and we get a different frequency also. It says 3125. Well there is no sample at 3115 which is where, well right up here, a reminder, the block is labeled 30, 3515 because that is the frequency of the sine wave but See, the peak is not showing up in the spectrum because this sampled spectrum, this DFT, does not have a sample at the frequency of 35 or 0.3515. The closest it can come with a peak value is 3125. That doesn't have an amplitude of 1. So the energy and the power has leaked out of the peak frequency at 3515 and it's leaked into the sidebands but in fact the power 0 0.49, 0 0.7035, all the power of that sine wave is still contained in its spectrum. In other words you don't lose power. A, a signal will have the same power in either domain. Let's go back. 
I'm going to inverse Fourier transform. There we are back, and we've got the sine wave again. If I move this over to one of the peak values, you can see the peaks are, are 0.99 and minus 0.99, plus 1, minus 1. All right, let's go back to the to the app node here and see what else we're talking about here. All right. Power in the auto spectrum, we, we looked at the linear power and uh, the mean squared power or the power itself. So when we, when we say power, we mean the mean squared. When we say linear power, we're, we're taking the square root of it, basically. So let's go down here. Power units are always squared units. We mentioned that. Uh, let's go further down. Uh, all right. Okay, now we're going to look at a PSD. So what's a PSD? That's called a power spectral density, or what it really is is the power spectrum, the auto spectrum, normalized or divided by the frequency resolution. So this is a way when we take measurements and, and we want to compare, let's say, the power in two different signals, uh, they may have different frequency resolution because we took different number of samples, different sampling rate, and so forth. Uh, now we can compare them if they're in a PSD format. So let's go here and compute the PSD of the... I'm going to put this down. Let's go back to the, put this guy over here. Let's go back to our, our periodic sine wave, the one that's periodic in the window. And now I want to compute, and I have to go down here under transform spectra. And this is going to open up a dialog box. It's asking me to select the source file. I'm going to select the 3125 hertz. I'm going to change this over to power spectral density. And I want to say calculate with spectrum averaging, although we're not going to do any spectrum averaging. So here it is. The block size is only 128 in the frequency domain. That means that in the time domain, we're looking at 256 channels. Number of averages, I don't want to average at all. Uh, I'm going to do linear averaging, rectangular window, no windowing, and let's just go ahead and compute. All right, it's saying, where do you want to save this? You don't have a data block with any frequency data in it. Remember, Emiscope can only save measurements that are all time-based measurements or all frequency-based measurements in a single data block. So here I'm going to call this uh, uh, PSD, and we'll say it is uh, 3125. That's the frequency. And there it is. Now that looks a whole lot like the one we had up before. Uh, and let me zoom in here a little bit, and we'll turn on the cursor again, and we can see that the peak is still there at the same frequency, a single peak in the data, because we have a periodic signal. The 12.8 is uh, a different magnitude, but remember the difference between the PSD and the the auto power spectrum or the auto spectrum is that we normalize by the frequency resolution. But look at over here, the power is exactly the same. So we haven't changed the power by simply normalizing our data. It's still the same power in this signal. Now, if we take the 12.8, where did that come from? Well, let's go look at the resolution of this data. That I find under the data, data block properties window. I'm going to go ahead and open that window. So the frequency resolution here is 0.078125. And if I divide my spectrum by that number, 
that is equivalent, I will guess, and that's in the app note of 12.8. So we took the magnitude uh, of a signal and we, which was one G squared, this is a, a power spectrum, and we multiplied it by 12.8 to get that, that number there. Okay, let's let's go look at the, I'm going to just put this down for a minute. Let's go to the non-periodic signal, and we're going to do the same thing. So now I want to choose that window, and I'm going to do the power spectral density, and I'll do a calculation. Okay, it says because I have the line cursor on here, it says, do you want to use data following the line cursor? And I'm going to say no. I want to use all the data. And here's the same dialog again. We don't need to change any of this. We're simply computing a, a PSD uh, without any spectrum averaging PSD, and it's going to be 3515. So here it is again. Look over here. The power has not changed. We haven't lost any power in this signal. But we again have the smearing of the signal. And I'll put the line cursor on here. So uh, this is, a again, a not an accurate frequency because we don't have a sample at that frequency. Let me zoom this here a little bit. Okay, so I'll make this a little larger. There we are. And again, if we took the the auto spectrum and divided by the resolution, we'd get the uh, we'd get this value here of 1.45. All right, let's go back to our app node and see what else we're talking about. Okay, well. I have been going through the non-periodic as well as the periodic, so we've kind of done a lot of this already. The other issue that comes up here is um, the one-sided versus the two-sided. Let me see where that discussion is, because that will basically take the power and transform uh, or multiply the power in the positive frequencies by by four. Here's a discussion right here. Consequently, power spectrum values from a two-sided FFT must be multiplied by four to compare them with the values from a one-sided. So the one-sided FFT is going to take all the power from the negative and put it into the positive. So that would be two times the power, but when we talk about MS power or mean squared power, we're actually going to square the two and, and we're going to have four times the value. Now where would we look at that? Let's just go take a quick look and see if we can um, look at that result. Let's go back to the the periodic signal. Now where I set that up is over here. Now you can see these units are uh, G squared. Well, this is our PSD. Let, let's go back to just the, I'm going to do the FFT. And now we have the window. We have the, the power spectrum of the signal. If I right click up here, in the what's called the measurement spreadsheet. We used to call it the traces. Now everything is in terms of measurements. We got rid of that terminology in, in our newer software. So now we just refer to M pounds, which are measurement numbers for each of these uh, measurements that we look at in the graphical area is referred to as a measurement. And then the the select the impound that's very important for animation and for creating animation equations and so forth. So we focused in on each of these being a measurement as opposed to uh, 
a trace. And that was a recommendation we got from one of our customers who said, I don't understand why you're using the word trace and measurement. Is it the same thing or is it different? And no, it isn't. It's the same. But I want to go here under show hide columns because there's a lot of columns in this spreadsheet that are not being displayed right now. So if I look here under measurement columns, measurement number columns, here's one called FFT and here's one called linear power. So let's turn both of those on and look at how this thing is set up. Okay, so this is a one-sided FFT and its units are linear. Now if I switch over to power, in other words, it wants to square the data. Uh, if possible, do you want to rescale the measurements? And I'll say yes. So now I have a true power spectrum here. Did it change anything? I don't believe it did. It just squared everything, but the, you know, one squared is still one. So we still have the same data. So that's how we can switch back and forth with our spectrum data from an RMS to a MS or mean squared back and forth. Now here the power is one-sided. So that means all the energy of the time signal has been put into this spectrum. Let me switch to a two-sided. Okay, it says, is it possible? Do you want to rescale? And I'll say yes. Now you can see that the magnitude has is one quarter. Remember, there's a there's a factor of four here because now we're we're uh, we got a power signal and we're we're dividing by four basically. The power itself has not changed in the signal. We're we're not getting rid of power. Now let me switch back here to uh, linear units, and it says you want to rescale. Now we've got two-sided, but the the peak is only 0.5 because the two-sided has assigned half of the signal to the negative frequencies. The power has not changed. So we're saying the power in the signal hasn't changed. Now it's being distributed over negative and positive frequencies. And in fact, the amplitude is also distributed. Only half of the amplitude is, is here with the positive frequencies. The other half is with the negative frequencies, which we never display because of the what's called the Hermitian symmetry of any DFT, any spectrum that we compute of any time signal is going to have this symmetric property so that we never need to look at the negative frequencies. And in an intuitive sense, what does negative frequency mean? That's, that's a little hard to get your, wrap your brain around. Positive frequency, yeah, I have a sine wave here that's at 0.3125. I understand what that means by looking at it in the frequent or in the time domain, and and I see a peak in the spectrum, so that is showing me, you know, a, a sine wave with a certain frequency in it. You can see that we still in the time domain we still have the same thing. So all these different uh, properties of a spectrum, whether it's linear or power, whether it's a two-sided or a one-sided they all matter when we're looking at uh, our, our signals in, in each domain or the other. All right, I think we've pretty well covered everything in that app. Now, let's go down to the conclusions here and just uh, review them. Conclusions. If a sine wave is periodic in its sampling window and a one-sided FFT is used, the peak value of its auto spectrum will be equal to its time domain peak. So we just looked at that. All the signal is basically put into one side of its two-sided spectrum. If the sinus wave is periodic, number two here, in its sampling window, and it's a two-sided FFT, the peak value of its auto spectrum will be one half. The power in a linear now, when we say linear, its units are linear, or we've taken the square root here, the root means square, of the signal uh, is equal to the square root of the power uh, in the power frequency domain. Now, we didn't 
see that. We saw that MEScope actually corrects for that. So what this is saying is not technically what we just looked at. We saw the power never change because MEScope is saying, hey, your, your RMS versus mean squared, the power should not change. Uh, if a sine wave is non-periodic, we looked at the non-periodic, uh, the PSD will always be less than its time to main peak value due to the leakage. So we saw that, but the total power of a signal is the same as the power of its time to main, independent of whether it is periodic or non-periodic in its sampling window. So that's what we tried to show here with this, uh, with this example. Let's move on to the next one because that's going to be more involved. We're going to use some macro programming and uh, we're going to run over an hour today. I can tell you that right now. I'm going to say no, I don't want to save this project. Let's go get this project. It's an OEM tutorial. Now, as I said in the introduction, we're going to look at MIMO signal processing where I take some signals and uh, and I simulate the excitation, and this is our old friend, the gem beam here. So this is our model. Uh, we've all seen this. It's in one of our. Uh, I don't like the perspective on that. It looks a little funny. Let me change that while we're looking here. The way you change the perspective distance is you go to something called view control under display. You can see it put that little wheel up there. Now my perspective here is only at a value of 10. I'm going to crank that out to about 30 or so. You see what that did to the picture? It just makes it, it brings me in a little closer instead of being if I go to zero, that's infinity. It just doesn't look right to me. So I'm going to put some perspective on this thing. And that's how you do it with that command right there. And then I want to dismiss this whole thing. If I click away from it, uh, it should, let me see what happens here. Yeah, it goes back to that, that little rotating thing. There's some other controls in here that, that you can learn how to use, but Let's just go turn that off. You can see it's been turned on here because it's got a yellow background. We call that checked. When, when there's a yellow background on a command, that means it's been checked. Many of the commands toggle on and off like that. Now, let's go up here. I've got some hotkeys. And I'm going to take you through curve-fitting FRFs, if you can see that. The next hotkey says burst random response. We're going to simulate a burst random response of the gem beam to a random excitation. So it's as if we put a shaker on this gem beam and shook it. We're going to measure its acceleration response. We're going to do that with MIMO simulation. Then we're going to acquire cross spectra from those time domain records. Those random responses due to the excitation with a random, a burst random, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at the burst random here in a minute. And then finally, we're going to curve fit the spectra. So this is the one of the tutorials in the operating manual that takes you through a round trip. The round trip being we're going to start out with some EMA mode shapes, experimental modal analysis mode shapes by curve fitting some FRFs from the gym beam. And then we're going to use those mode shapes in the MIMO analysis to synthesize some FRFs and multiply the FRFs by the spectrum of the burst random excitation, compute the responses. Then we're going to take those responses into an acquisition window as pre-recorded time data. That's a standard use of our acquisition window. Uh, we're going to compute some cross spectra between each of the responses on the gym beam and a reference response. Now, the reference response is very important because that allows us to get the proper magnitude and phase relationship between all the accelerometers. They could be acquired simultaneously. In this case, they will be. But in the real world, as long as we have the same reference response, 
we can collect or acquire this cross-spectrum data uh, just maybe two channels at a time, the reference and one of what we call roving responses. So this is the way we would acquire OMA data uh, on a structure that's simply being excited by forces that we cannot measure or choose not to measure. Maybe they're distributed, they're too difficult to measure. We're just going to look at responses and then we're going to compare the answers we get, the OMA mode shapes, with the EMA mode shapes that we started the whole process with. Let's go over here and look at the, the project here for a minute. We have the Jim Beam structure model. Uh, we've got a number of data blocks here, so we're going to use each one of these and we'll look at them. Here's a burst random. Doesn't look like much in its, in its little the thumbnail there. We'll take a look at it. Here's the burst random responses. Here's the cross spectra. Here's our FRFs, our experimental FRFs, and then some synthesized FRFs, which we use in the MIMO. Down here are the EMA mode shapes that we're going to get here in a minute by curve fitting the FRFs. Uh, here's our acquisition window that's going to acquire data from the, res the random response data block. And then down here we've got a number of macro programs. So let's take a look at one of these macro programs that I wrote. And I did all these yesterday afternoon. They're very easy to write now uh, or to write for a case like this. Uh, when I say now, all copies of MEScope, any of the projects, if you have our latest software, include the macro programming as a standard feature. So it's not an option uh, like the signal processing or modal analysis or any of those. It's, it's part of the standard MEScope software. Okay, I just clicked on a macro, and here it is. Now, it's got a lot of commands in it. A macro is simply a spreadsheet with MEScope commands. And so let's, uh, I'm going to move some of these. I want to move this target window up here. I want to move the target window command. I want to move the description. And you can see there's some other there's some other columns here. I can either hide them or we can talk about them later. One that says delay after, step label, open dialog. I don't need any of those. You can see I'm not opening any dialogs. This this program's going to run without asking me for any further input. So let's just walk through some of these commands to give you an idea how to set up a macro to automate, in this case, curve feeding the FRFs. Uh, you start out and you use the add command up here, just like adding objects to a model or adding traces or traces, there I go, and add measurements, add DOFs to a shape table. This is our standard way of adding commands to this spreadsheet. And the only thing we need to pick in order to set the spreadsheet up uh, or a command in the spreadsheet is we pick a target window and then we pick one of the commands in that window. So this first command here says, and then it's good to read these descriptions uh, because that way you can pick the one that, that makes the most sense for what you want to do. This, is, this command is coming out of the ME scope window or the PRJ window, if you will. So we're using the, the little acronym PRJ to be the project window or the MEScope main window. And there's a command in there called Windows Minimize All. Well, if I go up here under Windows and I come down here, there it is, Minimize All. There's the command. So this macro is simply using that command and it will execute it automatically when I run this program. And over here is a description. The next one says center the BLK FRS. Well, those are the that's the FRS window that we're going to curve fit. All the commands have this display center the data block in this case data block window. Uh, now it says this is a macro command display the cursor. Let me click on that. This command has some parameters. Okay, it, instead of turning on a cursor, I'm going to say turn them all off. So normally to turn off a cursor, you would execute the command that you use to display it. In this case, we have a macro command, a special macro command that will turn off 
all the cursors. So the other command, the other parameters here don't don't apply. All right, here we are in the data block, and this one says open up the curve fitting, initiates curve fitting for modal parameters. Delete all the fit data. These are standard things you would do when you go into curve fitting. Set up the mode indicator. Now here it's just telling it which mode indicator. Use the CMIF. Use the imaginary data. And set the threshold. This is a noise threshold. Set it at uh, 20%. You can see it can vary from 10 to 90. Now do a quick fit. So that's my favorite curve fitting command. And on this nice clean data that we have from the Jim Beam, you can simply execute quick fit and it will do all the curve fitting for you. And then it's going to position the windows. It's going to position the, the uh, structure window. Uh, now this, this is a very, this is a new command with macros. Any of these macro commands uh, show up in the macro window. So if I go up here under macro, you can see there are some new commands in here for the uh, for the ME scope window, and if I go under, let me see if I can find this command here, uh, window position, there it is right there. So that command is, is setting the position of the window, and you can see the left side, the top side, uh, the left side and top are set at zero. These are percentages from zero to 100 or zero to one. And then the right side is halfway through the hemiscope, what we call the work area, and then the bottom. And then the next one is going to be the FRFs on the other half of the work area. So 0.5, top is 0, right side is 1, bottom is 1. So pretty simple. You just have to get used to, to using these. And then we're going to start the animation. So curve fit shapes, animate shapes. Now we're still in curve fitting. We can animate the curve fit data directly from the data block before we even save the shapes. Now it's going to put up a user message and it says press continue to save the shapes. Well, where's continue? We'll see that in a minute. It's, it's going to be down on the progress bar at the bottom of the emiscope window. Now it's going to tell the macro to go to sleep for 500 seconds. So that's almost eight minutes. And it's just going to sit there waiting for me to press the continue button. Uh, now it's going to unselect the shapes or unselect the modes. See, we're still in curve fitting. we got curve fitting going on here, the curve fit command. It's going to unselect all the shapes in the EMA shape table. It's going to save them. And then it's going to position the shape table. Let me scroll this up here so we can see what it's doing. Uh, I'm going to position the EMA shape table at uh, the top of the window on the, on the right side. It's going to position the data blocks on the bottom. And it's going to, again, start the animation. So let me just go and run this program. Now I can run it two ways. I can just say macro run once and it's going to run that program. Or I can use one of these hotkeys. And here's a hotkey that I have defined called curve fit FRS. Where did I do that? Over under macro. Macro hotkeys. Here's the hotkey setup. Now a hotkey is something new that comes with the macros so that I can make a push button process out of this. So here, here are my hotkeys. Again, this is a spreadsheet. I can add as many hotkeys as I want by using the add button here. And uh, my first hotkey is called Curfit FRS. And it's going to execute a macro program called Curfit. FRS. So that's the macro right here that we've been looking at. See, I can, I can assign this hotkey uh, to any one of my macros. Here's all the macros, or I can set it to none if I choose to disable it. Now, this machine name uh, has to do with our archival database, our machine-based database. This is for monitoring. So one of the properties that 
or one of the reasons that we have these macros is so that we can set up a, up a scope to monitor, continuously monitor in the field, or to automate a, a modal test, an impact test, and we can put that data into what used to be called Mechanicom, now we just call it our archival database, a much larger database. Uh, it can hold uh, megabytes of data, much more than the MEScope database can. So it's a machine-based database, and if I set the macro up, then I can apply this, this hotkey just to a particular machine in the database, and I can have various test articles or machines in the database that would be uh, where I want to archive data for them. So for monitoring, I can be monitoring in the field. I can take one of our vibrant portable boxes with the computer and ME scope and the analyzer and everything in the box out to the field, uh, do some troubleshooting, maybe set it up with these macros and, and uh, hotkeys to simply continuously acquire and post-process data, put it into the database. I can control all this from another program that's part of our monitoring software called the console now. So these hotkeys can actually, I've, I've got them all set to no, but if I put, if I turn these on to yes, and I just do that by clicking on them, now it's going to make these same hotkeys available in the console program. Now the, con, the, the monitoring software and the database, the archival database, are all network-based. So I can have the database in the cloud. I can be accessing data in that database from the console anywhere on the Internet. Uh, the console is a no-cost piece of software that comes with the uh, monitoring, one of the monitoring options to Scope now. What we used to call Mechanicom, we've now changed into simply another option or series of options to ME scope. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but uh, I want to express the importance of this, and then you'll see the utility of using these hotkeys and macros to automate basically anything that you want to do in ME scope. So if you do a modal test and you don't pick up ME scope for six months, and now you come back and, and you got a slightly different test article, you got to do another modal test, another impact test, or if you're doing troubleshooting work where you got to go out and do some troubleshooting with an impact test on a machine or a structure, or in production if you're using MEScope. We have customers that are now using MEScope for what we call uh, qualification testing. They impact the structure, they curve fit the data, they measure the modal properties, and they compare them with uh, what we call baseline properties that you can store for any test article in the archival database. So we're expanding our, our horizons here with MEScope by providing this, uh, the macros and the hotkey. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead here and just push one of these hotkeys and see what it does. So let's go ahead and do that. And bingo, it's doing the curve fit, and it just went racing through a whole bunch of stuff here. And now I put up that message that says, uh, press continue to save shapes. So where's continue? Well, that's way down here at the bottom. You can see that the macro is in the sleep mode. Uh, it's going to sleep for about eight minutes, eight plus minutes. Uh, I set it for 500 seconds. So until I press continue, it's not going to move from where it is right now. You can see I'm animating the shapes. I've done a quick fit on my FRF data. Uh, here is the data here. There's, there's 99 FRFs from 33 points on this structure. Let me go over here and put the point labels on. So there's all the test points. Uh, just a quick review. This was, this was a test where we impacted a point 15 in the Z. How do I know that? Well, if I look at my my uh, my measurement DOFs here, you can see that the the roving DOF is changing one x one y one z. The reference is minus 15 in the z. So that means that we impacted at 15 in the z, and we roved a triaxial accelerometer around to all these different points. So this was done with a four-channel analyzer, 
and uh, 33 measurements. So there's 33 points. If I rotate this guy around here, you can see that on the back side there's the last three points that were where the accelerometer was attached. Now the model is all set up with the local measurement directions and so forth so that this data will animate correctly as it was acquired uh, from the from the gym beam. Okay, you can see my progress bar now is moving along here because it's waiting on me to continue. But I want to look at these results. This is my curve fit data. This is the the red line is the fit function laying on the data. Below here is my CMF uh, CMIF mode indicator, and then each of the uh, vertical lines is one of these modal frequencies that the curve fitter found, and you can see here in this uh, in this what we call the modal parameter spreadsheet. I've got the frequency, the damping in hertz, the damping in percent, and then residue magnitude and phase. So as I as I click right here, I'm animating right off of my curve fit data. I can change the animating shape. And before I save any shapes, I simply am displaying the curve fit data, the frequency, and the damping, basically the mode shape here uh, of each of these modes. So this gives me my first look at the curve fit results to verify that, in fact, uh, I've got some, uh, some good, some valid modal data by curve fitting. Uh, this experimental FRF data. Let me go back here and turn this off. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit the continue button. Remember it said press continue to save the shapes and then we'll have a shape table with those shapes in it. So this is just a, a curve fit procedure that I would normally go through. And now you can see that I've got the shape table up above with EMA shapes in it. And down below I still have the FRF data block and it's open to curve fitting. So now I, I've got two animation sources. I can animate out of a shape table or I can animate from a data block. Uh, in this case the curve fit data in the data block. We can also animate by just putting a cursor in the in the raw data itself, the FRF data, and animating that shape data. But now I can compare and again, just walk through and make sure that I have a shape table with some valid shapes in it. So you can see all these different shapes. And I'm just clicking through. Uh, I can go back and click down here in the, in the data block and, and animate those. So I've got two sources. As I click from one source to the other, it will show me the shape data that I'm clicking on uh, from that source. So this is just a, a nice visual to confirm that I've got some, some good results here. There is the first mode of the structure, the first flexible mode. That's a torsional mode of the, of the vertical plate. That's what I expect to see. The second mode is a a bending mode, you can see some complexity in that curve fit result, but it's still what I would accept as a valid curve fit result of the second mode. And we can just go through and examine. There's a nice clean torsion mode of the top and bottom plates. Uh, they're out of phase with one another. That is expected. Uh, and as I click down here, there's a bending mode out of phase, another torsion mode in phase. So very uh, reasonable results here for, for this structure. Okay, let's go look at the second macro now. I'm gonna I'm gonna go on here and uh, so I guess I'm I'm done with this macro. It's just gonna continue to animate. Let's go look at the second one called Burst Random. Now this is a whole series again of commands and rather than look at everything let's just go ahead and execute this hotkey that says Burst Random Response and see what it does here. 
Okay, well, what it's done, first of all, is it's taken my mode shapes and it's synthesized FRFs. I should have put out a message to explain this to you, but here's what we're looking at. Uh, I'll click OK. It says continue to display burst random force at 15Z. So what we're going to do here is take this FRF data with a reference at 15Z and the mode shape data has the same DOFs in it, uh, a reference at 15Z, and we've gone ahead and used the synthesis command in the shape window, the shape table window, with the EMA shapes in it, and we've synthesized FRFs. So the red line is the FRF synthesized, the blue line is our actual test data. Now here's one where they don't match up very well. Uh, again, this is a log plot, so we're looking at several, we're looking at four decades of data here. and the test data actually has a ramp in there. The curve fitter takes account of that, but the mode shapes that I got by curve fitting this particular high frequency here at 1500 hertz uh, did not take into account the what we call the residual effects of the out, out of band mode. So this is strictly a synthesis of the FRF using the modal data. And you can see it doesn't line up perfectly, but it's a pretty good match, especially around the high resonance peaks, because those are the modes that are going to dominate the dynamics, the dynamic response of the structure. Remember, this is acceleration data, so in the real world of displacement, we would even pay more attention to the lower frequencies to see whether they match up. But we normally look at data like this over a broad range and with acceleration you can see how well the higher frequencies overlay. But even though the, the peaks don't necessarily match, the phases are, when the peaks do match, the phase is right on the money, matches well with the data. So that means that we've got a pretty good curve fit of this experimental FRF data with the experimental modal properties of this model or this, uh, this gym beam. So let's go ahead and press continue. Okay, now it says another little box that's coming up here. It says press continue to calculate the MIMO responses. Here is our burst random input. Now I synthesized this ahead of time. <coughs> this is a random signal. It's going to be applied at 15Z on the model. It's got units of pounds and it's an input. So this input output is very important. Is this an input to the model? Is this an output or is it both or is it a cross measurement? So a cross measurement would be an FRF. Uh, it's neither input nor output or a cross spectrum. That's neither in input nor output. An auto spectrum would be an input or an output, and in this case, this is a time record. Let me just zoom in here to see, and I synthesize this with the, uh, up here with a new data block command. Now, this is not completely programmable yet, but let me just show you when you go to the new data block, uh, there's a number of parameters that you have to set up, and here's what I set up. It's a block size of 4,000 samples in the time domain, 2,000 in the frequency domain. It's always half the number. Uh, maximum frequency in the frequency domain is going to be 2,000 hertz. And down here I've said synthesize a block with 25 averages in it. So it's going to use random signals, RMS value of one, uh, one measurement, and a burst random width of 60%. And what that means is the random signal is going to exist for 60% of the sampling window. And then it's going to go to zero. The reason we do that, this is an ideal signal for exciting a structure with a shaker so that there's no leakage in the signals. 
if I excite it with a random signal, what's called a pure random, I have to window the data with what's called a Hanning window in order to eliminate, or not eliminate, but reduce the leakage. This type of a excitation will produce response signals that are completely contained in their sampling window so that there's no additional signal processing needed on the raw data. We can go ahead and use it in the FFT and we won't have leakage. So that's the reason we're using this. Okay, this went ahead and stopped my, uh, my burst random. So let me go ahead. Well, let's just take a look at this. And here we are. We have a burst random signal. This is, but this is 25 sampling windows because I want to average this data. And we'll see in a minute how we average this data together. Let's do the FFT of it real quickly, and you'll see what it looks like in the in the frequency domain. So there it is. Let me put the Bode up. Here's the, and I'll zoom in. This is just random phase random amplitude. That's what this signal looks like in the frequency domain. Let's go back to the time domain. Um, so I can go back and forth all day long and look at the properties of this signal. I'm going to go ahead and push the hot key again and we'll continue back with what we were doing. Okay, this says this is the synthesize that we looked at. I'm going to press continue. Now it says press continue again, so I'm going to go down here to the bottom, press continue, and now it's going to compute the responses, and here they are. So again, I've got a MIMO response, and you can see it doesn't, it doesn't damp out completely, but because of the damping of the modes, 60% was, certainly I probably could have gone to 80%, uh, damping of the the responses of the signal, and now I've got 33 or 99 of them. I've got one for every uh, measurement that I made on the structure, X, Y, Z, in all the directions at every point. So this is my responses. Let's go over here and look at the, uh, these are all outputs now, time responses, Let's go ahead, we're getting over time here. I'm going to go ahead and acquire the cross spectra. So I'm going to push that hot key to acquire the cross spectra from these responses. Okay, now this is, it says continue, press continue to acquire 25 averages. I've got this on the, what's called the scope mode. So here are the 25 averages coming in up here. I've got the acquisition window set up. Uh, to sample 4,000 samples, and I'm going to take, over here it says 25 averages, uh, and there's a number of setups here, but I'm going to compute cross spectra, and that's what's being computed down here, 25 cross spectra. Now the other thing we're going to do is use 5Z, which is on the other side of the the top plate from where we put in the the excitation, we're going to use that as a reference. So right here, input output, all of the accelerometers are outputs except the one from 5Z. That's going to be both an input and an output. And so in our terminology, that is a reference. That's the one that we're going to compute the phase and the magnitude of the cross spectrum with respect to 5Z and all the other responses. You can see it walking along here in the data block, uh, taking a 4,000 samples at a time and computing the auto spectrum or the cross spectrum down here. These are all the cross spectra, pretty much instantaneous from the, the signals up above. I'm going to go ahead and hit continue. Now it's going to start the averaging process. So you'll see here we're, we're doing 25 averages, walking through this data over here, and computing across spectrum. All right, it's done. It says press continue to save the spectra. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's waiting for me to do that. And here are the cross spectra that we computed from the output-only data or OMA data, if you will.
Now I'm going to go to the last button because we're running out of time here, and it says curve fit spec the spectra. So we applied a window. I'm not going to be able to go through the deconvolution window, but the curve fitter is running. It's using a stability method, and it says uh, press continue to save your stable groups. Let's go down here and just look at the data. Uh, now, it didn't pick up this high frequency, so I may want to go back here and just adjust that parameter a little bit to see if I can get some some stable groups in here. Let me uh, crank that up a little bit. Well, I'm not locating all these modes right now. What did I do wrong? Let's reset and see what we get. Well, it's not quite what I expected to see. Uh, let's set the frequency tolerance at two. Ah, there, I gave it a little more frequency tolerance and oh, we set that back to two hertz. The damping is 1% damping tolerance. And now I want to clean this up a little bit. Uh, right there. Well, I wasn't able to recover all the modes, but if I go ahead and hit the continue button, uh, we can see that now we've got a curve fit laying on top of the data, and this is not as good a result as I would expect. The tutorial actually gets all of the modes, but let's go ahead and we've got nine of the, of the modes. And there were actually 10 of them, so not quite sure which ones we're missing here. Let me look at the MAC values between, uh, okay, it's saying modes are selected. Do you want to select all modes? Yes. And, okay, let's compare. This is the round trip comparison. The windowing that was used actually applied some damping. And you can see that we've identified some of the modes, but not all of them. This is a MAC value comparison between the EMA modes and the OMA modes. You can see a little bit of a, a, a difference going on there. We could run this again use, using the random data. I can go back here and let's just go back and acquire the cross spectrum again and see if things change at all. And then we're going to answer questions. Brian, do we have any questions? No I'm questions. I'm going through hit, hitting these macro commands again. Um, go ahead, Brian. Um, there are no questions. No questions. Okay. All right, well, pretty much got, got the same result again. Um, didn't find all the modes. And we got nine of them. And when I do the MAC calculation, I think we're going to probably see the same result that we already looked at. And pretty much the same thing. We, we, we got Several of the modes came out good. A, a MAC value above 90% is very good, so we certainly found all the strong modes in the data. Okay. That's the end of our discussion for this month. Next month we will uh, have a different topic. Uh, our plan now is to maybe use some of our app notes and go through those and the exercises in them. And, uh, and then use some more macro programming to show you how that is useful for doing any repetitive task uh, in ME scope. So talk to you next month. Uh, thanks for listening in today.